Seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6. Once the spacecraft rockets out of Earth orbit, the moon is a three-day journey. The crew is the tip of the iceberg. In Apollo 11, there were 400,000 people underneath that all had to do their job or we weren't going to make it. And I think every crew realized that. It was a team effort of NASA that got us to the moon. These are... Uh probably the finest systems engineers at the world. They're all young. Uh, average age was 26. I was the oldest guy that day. I was 36. OK, guys, it's now time to get down to business. Uh, we're about ready to land uh, a man on the moon. And uh, I start talking to him because I feel compelled to talk. I was probably the most emotional of the flight directors. From the day of our birth, we were met for this time and place. And today, we will land an American on the moon. Whatever happens here today, I will stand behind every decision you will make. We came into this room as a team, and we will leave as a team. Then I tell my ground controller to lock the control room doors. And from now on, no person will leave or enter this room until we have either landed, we have crashed, or we have aborted. Those are the only three outcomes from this time on. The first thing, obviously, that we're going to have to do is to undock from the command module. Roger, how does it look? Are you going to see? Roger. And then uh, we rotated around so that Mike could sort of make a quick check of our landing gear. Listen, baby, everything's going just swimmingly. Beautiful. Then the first thing we need to do is establish communication with the Earth. Houston Eagle, how do you read? Bye-bye, Eagle. We're standing by for your burn report. Over. Roger, the burn was on time. Tempo in the room picks up right as we acquire spacecraft telemetry and we immediately got practice. X and Z notes. We've got communications problems you cannot believe. Columbia, Houston, we've lost all data with uh, Eagle. Please add in the rear fly on the high gain over. We couldn't communicate with the lunar mount. Eagle, Mike Collins Houston, could because he could see him. He could point his antennas at him and talk to him. So what we would do is we would say, uh, Mike, have the crew select a different antenna. Houston, we've lost him. Tell him to go ass on me over. Take uh, Omni Bravo or Omni Delta. Will you roll the spacecraft a little bit for us? He'd roll the spacecraft, we'd get data. Eagle Houston, uh, we recommend uh, you all 10 right. will help us on the uh, high gain signal strength, over. Yeah, you should we have now, Houston. Eagle, we got you now. It's looking good, over. And at uh, descent minus five minutes, I give the go for a uh, powered descent. Go to con you go to continue power descent. You're a go to continue power descent. The descent was very tricky business. Our plan was to start about 50,000 feet altitude, 3,000 miles per hour, to use one continuous rocket burn 
to decelerate to a hover in the landing area. Eagle, Houston, everything's looking good here, over. Throttle up. And I get confirmed throttle and telemetry drops out again. And I'm back in this ground roll. Do I have enough information to continue the descent or not? Okay, all flight controllers, gonna go for landing. Retro, go. Lido, go. Guys, go. Control, go. Telcom, go. GNC, go. Ecom, go. Surgeon, go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Houston, you're a go for landing, over. Program alarm. And about that time, uh, we got a, a computer alarm. Of, 1202. 1202. 1202. The computer was giving us trouble. It was a big attention getter. My first thought, oh no, we've lost it. We're not going to make it. All we had was 1202, which is kind of disconcerting. Uh, you lose information, plus you've got an alarm, and you don't really know what it is. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. I was reaching for my checklist to turn to this program alarm when the guidance guy, Steve Bale, said, we're go, flight on that alarm. Gene took his word, you know, okay, we're go. He didn't ask for explanation, we're go. Roger, we got you, we're going at alarm. Now the landing radar can begin to pick up range and velocity of the ground beneath us, and it compares that with what the uh, computer thinks it ought to be, and there's a big difference. Hold on. Our position check down range to be a little off. Roger, 1201, Well, it's extremely serious. Is the computer breaking? Is it telling us it's not functioning right? 1201, roger, 1201 alarm. What is the alarm telling us? We're go, same type, we're go. Same type, it was a different number, but same type. He said, same type flight, we're go. 47 degrees, roger. The computer was so busy, and it couldn't get all the jobs done, so it was dropping off these other little jobs down on the end and not doing them, which were jobs that weren't really that critical. Just as Mission Control decides to ignore the computer alarms, the LEM sends another strange signal. 37 degrees. We just saw this strange trajectory that we'd never seen in training. Standard speed down three and a half, 47 forward. He went down to about 400 feet, stopped his descent, and leveled off and started flying horizontally across the moon. He didn't tell us, but out the window, what they were seeing was a big boulder field. Our computer was steering us toward football stadium-sized craters, surrounded by steep slopes and covered with very large boulders. 50 down at two and a half, 19 forward, altitude, velocity, light. Neil had the one thing we did not have. He had the out-the-window view. 15 forward. He knew whether he was over a safe place to land or over a boulder field. My job was to tell him how much fuel he had. And when it had zero, that was our best knowledge. We had zero. Five and a half down. Nine forward. The fuel states were falling, and we were getting close to what was going to be an abort situation. 100 feet, three and a half down, nine forward. When we got to about 100 feet, the low level light came on, and uh, Charlie Duke gave us a call of 60 seconds. Simple call, Eagle, 60 seconds. 60 seconds. We better get on the ground pretty soon. And he had 60 seconds to land. And after that 60 seconds, it would be aboard. Down two and a half. I didn't want to disturb Neil's concentration because I knew he was really working that problem. Two and a half, picking up some dust. And now we crew is kicking up some dust. So we know they're darn close to the surface, but they were scooting pretty fast across it last time we heard. Four forward, drift into the right a little. We used most of our remaining fuel, finding a relatively level and smooth landing spot. And a half. 30 seconds. We had 30 seconds to land. I mean, it was deathly silent. Now, I don't think he was going to actually abort. I mean, that wouldn't have been the right stuff. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. HGA at a descent. And I looked over at him, and, and he looked at me. And uh, th there was not a, a great emotion, but there was a, a, a smile of satisfaction on both of our faces, and we shook hands. 413 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. 
Roger, twin tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. That you finally can say we just landed the moon. We hit the moon with 17 seconds of fuel remaining. Hey everyone, Scott Roberts and Jerry Hubble here with the Explorer Lines Live and the Open GoTo community. Uh, hope you guys are having a great week so far. Uh, it went by like super fast, you know. When you have a when you have a big star party uh, in the middle of the week, <laughs> and then you know, and before you know it, it's Friday. So, um, but I wish uh, it was Friday. Yeah, it will be very soon. So <laughs> I'll probably be working until Friday. So. Uh, but uh, who do we got here with us today? I've been chatting with them a little bit. Um, we've got Michael Whitaker, James the Astrophotographer, Gary Palmer, uh, Dusty Haskins, Astro Beard, Jeff Wise, uh, Tyler Bowman, uh, Aaron B. Thompson. Uh, he says, lots of laughs, smoking in the control room. Kind of like smoking in the boys' room. I think there was a band that sing a song, something like that. Anyhow, Chuck Lewis, um, Bergman Scooter, uh, Wade Prunty's with us. Uh, who else? I think, oh, Dave Ings with us. Of course, Brett Blake. Book Davies. And um, Mike Wiesner. So, uh, and I'm don't know if I mentioned it or not, but Wade Prunty. So um, and Wade and I have been talking to each other a little bit, uh, chatting about, um, uh, you know, he has a, a show on the Clear Skies Network, which we broadcast our star parties on. And uh, so uh, we might be doing a little bit of collaboration. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, uh, I, um, I wanted to uh, also mention today. Um, I've been talking to with the uh, with the uh, editors of uh, Astronomy Technology Today magazine, and they are going to offer a free subscription. I think it's a digital subscription to ATT uh, to all the Explorer Alliance members. So, um, will whether you've joined before or you are joining now. Um, you know, there'll be another benefit, uh, which is pretty cool. So that's really nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's a great magazine. I've been subscribing to it since almost day one, 10 mm -hmm. years ago, right. 11 years ago. Right. Yeah. It's a great magazine. I mean, it's one of the few magazines it's like all reviews and, uh, you know, all about the gear itself. So if you're, if you're trying to sort out gear and you want to know, you know, what, uh, what, uh, you know, how the reviews go or um, that type of thing. You know, in print, uh, it's a very reliable source. And um, so I think it's a good one. And it's different from like Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazine in that regard. You know, there's no uh, like uh, astronomy news. So we got some comments here. Um, let's see.
Paul Mestiers, he says, hi, yeah, I'm new to astrophotography. Well, this is, a, this is a good place to get started. A lot of people here on our, in our chat room um, and uh, people that we bring on to the star parties, uh, they know a lot about astrophotography, so tons of resources there. Um, let's see. <laughs> Dave Ng <laughs> called out the song Brownsville Station covered by Motley Crue, Smoking in the Boys' Room. Yeah. And Mike Wiesner says, it's lonely here on Facebook, Scott. What's the most popular streaming service for the ES Live shows? Um, we are on Facebook. I just looked. So I don't know. Let me look real quick. I guess, I guess what he's talking about, how many... What's the audience size for each of the different platforms, I guess? Oh, the audience size? Audience is biggest on Facebook. But right now, I mean, there's, you know, a lot of people, um, like, they don't like social media. Uh, a social media in the respect that, uh, you know, they'll have, like, a news feed or something. And, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of politics and opinion and stuff like that that kind of after a while it's like he gets a little burned out on it i understand that um a lot of people watch a couple other platforms uh mike which would be twitch and uh, youtube so twitch has a good chat uh stream on it and so does youtube uh so you'll see i think on both of those you actually see the combined uh chats from other social media Let's see. Maybe YouTube does it better. <laughs> David Ng says that he jumps between all the platforms. <laughs> That's cool. I do too. I do too. Uh, YouTube uh, will have um, chats, it looks like, from all the different uh, platforms listed down there. So this uh, Restream uh, chat bot that I use uh, uh, has, uh, has it all. And, of course, I, uh, on, on this stream right now, you can actually see your chats coming up on the, uh, you know, on the video. So that's cool. But uh, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about, um, uh, you know, I, I was looking at the customer service uh, uh, boards where people have, um, you know, they put in a case and ask a question or maybe want some service or a replacement part. And uh, uh, one of the things that's a perennial is uh, where people see like a speck of dust between the lens elements of the refractor and some of them go to all the way to the point of where they take the, the optics apart. Okay. Yeah. Right. And, uh, now, is that uh, for, for performance reasons or is that just for looks? <laughs> it's looks. It's yeah, looks. Performance. You know, so, so people, people understand they, performance. They, I mean, they know that that doesn't matter. It, it's zero effect on performance. Okay. Uh, you could have, you could almost put, hold on for a second. I think, I think people actually punch <laughs> holes through mirrors. And it doesn't affect the performance, isn't that right? Uh, that's true. Uh, well, we made Schmidt Castle grains at Mead Instruments, where we would drill like a, you know, a two-inch hole and right through the mirror. And uh, why, why would you do that? I mean, that ruins a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> let let alone a little bit of dust, you know. Okay, and you so you're building the mirror. scopes. You're not in a clean room. No one's wearing a bunny suit. Okay, all right. Uh, of course, you got compressed air and stuff like that, and you're you got the parts there and everything. But you know, little tiny, I mean, tiny pieces of something can fall down on it. And uh, yeah, okay, you blow it off again, and then you build the scope, and and you look inside of it, and you blow it off again, and and then. But um, uh, I I will tell you that uh, you know, no telescope maker in the world, except except for when they're making space optics. When they fly these things into space, they build them in a, in a control, very controlled environment. 
Uh, they're, they're, it's built in a clean room. Uh, you can imagine the cost and the expense of what a, an amateur telescope would cost if we did build it in a clean room and it was delivered, you know, hermetically sealed and stuff. And but as soon as you open up the bag and and, uh, nope, and expose it to up. outside elements, you're going to have dust come back in there. Right, exactly. We live. This is our world. We live in that kind of situation. So, but I mean, it, it absolutely it has no effect. And um, you know, and you can tell that the next time you get to visit a professional observatory, if you get to see the mirror on one of these big telescopes. Uh, you will see, at, at first it's really super impressive, but if you got down there and really looked at the mirror, you're going to see pits, you're going to see, you know, uh, polish marks in it, you're going to see all kinds of stuff. You're and especially spiders, if you take a see flashlight, what's that? You're going to see bird crap and spiders and... <laughs> yeah, meanwhile they're making discoveries, you know, they're, they're doing research, you know, so, yeah. Ken Noble says dust only matters on a camera sensors. That's true. Yeah, you, you want to you want to get that cleaned if you can, you know. But uh, even that, I, you know, people do flat fields and stuff, and you know. So I think a lot of astrophotographers, once they build their system, they really don't want to take it apart if they can get away with it. So no, it's sealed up. Once you, especially if you got a corrective optic in front of it, it's all the dust can't get in there typically. Uh, You'll want to blow it off with a can, you know, can of air. You don't, you really don't want to touch it as as little as you can. You don't, you don't want to touch any of these optics. Yeah. Uh, if you can get away with it, if you can if you can stifle your impulse to clean. Yeah. Uh, you want to blow it off. You want to blow it off and then leave it. And you know, I love the way telescopes look too. I think that telescopes are beautiful. Uh, you know, I, you know, I certainly understand how someone falls in love with the telescope and refractors in particular, because it attracts a, a crowd that's looking for precision. Uh, and then they start looking for perfection. OK, and uh, they'll look at every tiny little thing that's on on the instrument. And um, uh, so we do, you know, there are people that look at their equipment more than they do actually use it, you know, so, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, uh, but, um, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, mostly in the amateur world, we're trying to make telescopes affordable enough so that you can have, you know, $10,000 technology for $2,000 or less, you know, that's really the goal. That's really the goal. So, um, one time I bought, uh, when I was working at OPT, we had uh, bought a used Perkin Elmer. Uh, it was a, it wasn't a Schmidt Cassegrain, but it was a specially designed uh, Cassegrain with a corrector lens in the front, and it wasn't a Mac. It was like this spe really special thing. And I remember buying it for like $500, and I think I sold it for... 700 or 650 or something. It was, it weighed too much. None of my mounts that I had in the store would really properly hold this thing because it weighed a ton. I mean, really thick steel tube and all the rest of this. And it was, uh, and the back would, it, you would have had to have a machine shop make a custom bracket or a thread on thing to fit on the back because it was only, it was made for, you know, science. And, uh, uh, I heard that the original price on it was it was well over fifty thousand dollars for from Perkin Elmer to build this thing. So, you know, and sold on the used market for less than a thousand, which seems to be a shame. But that's what it was. I am sure that the optics were incredible. You know, um, but not a very versatile instrument. It was a very special purpose instrument. You know, thank God that's I was able to finally people. sell it. Right. <laughs> you know, right. Well, people. You know, as much as an instrument like that costs to build, it's the value is in how useful it is. Yes, that's true. Yeah, you know, that's, that's what true. people pay a thousand dollars for. It's only good for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I would say you know, uh, with anybody's optics, you know, that you want to you want to make sure that that a, a you don't let an optic go so dirty that there's like a film of stuff because that will reduce contrast on the optic. Um, you know, you want to keep the your... coatings, the coatings, 
get impacted too. You, you really want to blow off the. They can with mold and yeah. and uh, fungus can actually grow into a coating. Um, you know, so that's you'd rather that not happen. Um, uh, and that so you want to keep your optics in a dry environment you know, as much as possible. If so, if you're on the east or west coast or anywhere where there's a lot of humidity. Uh, if you have an observatory, you'd like to probably uh, monitor the humidity inside, um, and you can get dehumidifiers uh, pretty inexpensively. Uh, no reason to keep it more humid. I mean, the the ultimate would be no humidity, but um, and uh, you know, uh, cover cover the optics when you're not using them. You know, but some astronomers don't. They don't have that luxury. They have they're running it remote. I, I would imagine the MSRO, you never cover the optics, right? Well, we keep it off quite a bit of time. Yeah, yeah. I would say the majority of the time is. But, but Myron, I've got a biological robotic system to go do work, you know, put the covers on. Right. It, its name is Myron. Myron. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got that biological entity. Did you have a, a chip robot. installed in Myron so that uh, all yeah. you have to do is send a... A scripted command, and he goes out yeah. and does things. Twenty-four hours a day, yes. That's cool. <laughs> that's cool. But yeah, so we don't. Yeah, so if you can, that's one thing I've been thinking about is is providing a uh, a servo cover <laughs> system to flip the cover off and on. But it would be a flat field or two, an electroluminescent display to yeah. be able to do flat fields and uh, cover the scope. Right. Right. The, the flip flat. Is like that. Yeah, uh, that's that's kind of cool. I like that idea. Mike Wiesner says in 1999 I got a tour of the Mead factory floor in Irvine. It was fascinating. I probably gave you the tour, or it was one of them, anyways. I gave lots of tours at Mead Instruments. It was fun. Uh, James, the astrophotographer, said he had a spider build a web as he was using his mount. Yeah, spiders, spiders, and telescopes go together. Um, says I use a hand blower with a HEPA filter. That would work, definitely. Um, and Dusty Askins says if you get that on your optics, we could always check it out with your microscope, Scott. I think there's a lot of customers that might. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and then Dave Ng says I use a camel hair brush where where the camels are grown in the vacuum of space. <laughs> Where do you guys come up with this stuff? Okay. Um, and then James, the astrophotographer, says, what would be the best way to clean the primary on a set without disassembling? Well, if it's a refractor, it's just going to be the exterior lens, you know, uh, uh, pretty much. And it's just, uh, you know, the, the best way is just to use compressed air. Um, if you have an air compressor, you want to put two inline filters, filter cartridges, to capture any oil that might be coming out of the, the compressor. You know, uh, some people use that. Um, uh, if you are using uh, canned compressed air, you you know you always want to hold it so that it's the cans kind of aimed straight down, and uh, you know you start off with a couple of uh, sprays. I always hold my hand in front so that if I if there's any propellant that's going to sp spray out, it hits my hand first, okay? And then what I do is I, I remove it. If you're ever looking at your optics and you see tiny little bright spots, okay, uh, a lot of people think that that is uh, coatings coming off. It typically is not. It's usually uh, spit coming from your mouth as you open up. <laughs> you're looking at it going, hey, this is dirty. And, and of course, now you've got bright spots on on your optic and that, that's from you. Um, again, does not harm the image at all, okay? But if it bothers you, you can, you can clean it off. Guys, what I use is um, I make up my own cleaning solutions and it, it is uh, one third isopropyl. I'll write it down for you. Two thirds distilled water. And then three drops of, this is the secret weapon right here. The Dawn? No. 
Formula 409. <laughs> oh, okay. To, to, make a, to make a quart of cleaning solutions. So that's, that's the solution that can take off like... Um, you know, smoky residue, pollens, uh, makeup, um, you know, all that other stuff. Uh, and then, you know, once you got that stuff off, if you want to come down with just like pure isopropyl and then, um, and then just a final uh, clean down with just pure distilled water and that'll eliminate spots and stuff, you know. And, uh, you know, but you start off with, at first with a camel hair brush uh, you know, because you don't want to grind, uh, maybe you get a grid of sand or something off to the side. You don't want to grind it into anything. That formula will not hurt any coatings. Absolutely not. Uh, Dave, if, if you have, if you use any lens cleaner, commercial lens cleaner, uh, I think that Al Nagler told me he uses Windex. Okay. Um, if you have coatings that come off, okay, because of, normal cleaning, there's a defect in the coating, okay? You know the way they test coatings, okay, is they, um, Scott, would you graffiti my lens cap while my ED, ADCF is visiting, probably arise. Uh, Richard, I keep, just for this very purpose, a, uh, a pen, <laughs> so if you want me to, to write a, you know, a, you I've want me to put a Banksy image. image on there or something? I'll do it. I will. Hey, hey Scott, I've got an image that uh, Myron took. It's a close-up of what we had on <laughs> what we had on the 152 when we had it in the observatory. Oh, let's check so it let, out. Let me show you. <clears> was gonna, it a dirt uh, clod? This is this is pretty good. So um, let me share. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. That was Look on the that. 152. Yeah. Uh, this might uh, lower contrast a little bit, <laughs> but I'll bet yeah, when you made bad. images, you can. Now this see is it. very. This is not. This is a lot bigger than. This is not quite as big as it appears. Well, I'm like sure the the uh, dust part quarter of an inch. Here. It looks like a half an inch, maybe a quarter of an inch. Oh my God. So what kind of bird made this? Yeah, so a bird dive dive bombed on the observatory. Yeah. <laughs> and uh but uh we oh. discovered that I don't know how long after it happened that we discovered it. It may have been a few days. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. But, but we cleaned the optics and got them pristine again. Yeah, right. This was back in uh September of two thousand eighteen. So I'm wondering if you have any images taken during that time with that thing on there. Yeah, I can I can go look for it. Yeah, you should look for one. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Wade says you should have seen my camera sensor flat I showed last night on the stream. Yeah, I'm. You know, I mean, we live in a dirty world, guys. You know, so. Um, how do you replying to Larry Birch? Absolutely. How do I attach a pick here? I don't think you can attach a pick onto the um, onto the stream. But what you could do, Larry, is send uh, Jerry Hubble an email with the image, and he can show it, um, or you can send it to to me. I usually let Jerry share his screen. Uh, send it to jrh at explorescientific.com. So. Okay, so um, yeah, that's, I mean, I could go on and on about stories of dirty optics and, and uh, you know, or like chipped, chipped mirrors, you know, like where you have like a giant concordial fracture on the edge of a mirror, you know, and people think, oh my God, you know, my, my telescope's now ruined, you know. All you have to do, if you have, if you, if you had a Newtonian and, and you drop your mirror, okay, God forbid, all right? But if you did, and, and a chunk of it broke off, as long as you did not induce a, a stress fracture through the mirror, okay? Which you probably wouldn't, okay? Uh, all you would need to do is take flat black paint 
and paint where the broken part was. And then yeah, if you like to chip the edge or something. If you yeah, it off. would be fine. You know, it would be fine. Yeah. Can I? Oh, somebody. Somebody wants me to show the fried eye pieces again. I oh, yeah. Them. Actually, I keep them right here under glass. OK. And, looks like um, a looks like a rock specimen from a from the moon or something. I know. Look at this. I mean, it was you, when you look at it up close. I don't know how good it shows, but you can see kind of the blue green color of it. That's glass mixed with metal. Uh, this was the aluminum. You know, this part right here is all the aluminum barrel. Um, the uh, the stainless steel um, eyepiece barrel is still pretty much intact, but yeah, it's super hot fire. And then this one, this is all that remained of another eyepiece. So there's glass inside of the barrel there. But yeah, these were replaced. You know, the guy had, luckily he had registered them and um, he was under the forever no fault warranty. And so, uh, and he was able to return what was left. <laughs> and uh, we replaced mm -hmm. that. Sadly, uh, you know, all the rest of his astronomy gear, uh, hopefully it was covered under insurance or something like that. So something that you want to do uh, is just a matter of course. Anyways, with homeowners insurance, you can insure your gear. Um, you know, a lot of gear does not have serial numbers on it. We try to put serial numbers on everything um, just for that reason, you know, especially if you get it stolen, you know. Uh, we like to um, we like to know when something's stolen. Uh, if you and ever have... Be reg what's that? It needs, it needs to be registered, too, so that you can tell the uh, insurance company that this is a serial number. It's been registered. That we, it's been we registered you, with Explore Scientific. You can prove that you bought it or that you yeah, have it. That's right. And sometimes this stuff shows up on the, you know, on eBay or somewhere, you know, Craigslist or something. Uh, and, uh, you know, usually the people that steal astronomical gear like that don't know what they, they've got, really. You know, they're just looking to make a quick buck on it. And um, uh, so, um, but, you know, if, uh, if we see a, if we get a reported hot, or stolen item and we know the serial number then if that part ever came in for maintenance or whatever down the down the pike we would be able to find it for you yeah yeah it was very unfortunate when uh, i still have the letter from the gentleman that uh turned him in and uh yeah it was sad i mean his whole house burnt to the ground you know so you guys probably saw the uh uh, on the news, the uh, pass it, uh, the Paradise, California fires. So that's where it was from. Yep. So that's that's that. Um, and a lot of those people are still getting on their feet. You know, it's happened quite a while ago. So, but um, I think that right now we will uh, we'll switch to what's going on with the uh, Open Go To community, Jerry. There's been quite a bit of activity over the last couple of days. We've got uh, a few new users that are logging on, and, and uh, typically people go to forums because they're having issues. It's not that they're there to uh, say good news, everybody. My system works great. <laughs> they typically, that's not the first. That's, that's at the end of the thread, right? That's not at the yeah, beginning yeah, yeah. of the thread. That's right. You know, so that's kind of it's not a too bad we don't have uh, inverse time where you have. I guess that would be worse if it worked great and then all of a sudden it stopped working. Right, <laughs> right. But so people get on there. Beginners have been getting on there the last couple of days to report different things that they they have issues when they, they got a brand new Exos two or they got a brand new IXOS one hundred. Uh, it looks like the last uh, the last few customers had Exos twos, and they're just they're just they're new to astronomy. They're new to the mount. They're struggling with the polar alignment, typically is one of the issues they have. They're, they're struggling with how Explore Stars works and what is that. And then some people are jumping in with both feet and trying to learn about ASCOM and Explore Stars and everything, you know. And also people 
get ahead of the curve before they receive their equipment. They go out and research and read and figure things out beforehand, which is a great. Uh, but then they, they have questions about every little thing and they still haven't got their mount, but they want to find out about, about it. So that's the type of activity we've seen over the last few days. Um, yeah. There's a polar alignment still seems to be a big uh, issue with beginners. They, they have to wrap their heads around that. Well, understanding the coordinate system uh, is a big thing. And I posted recently uh, a little tidbit about the celestial coordinate system that people don't always understand in terms of how the scope moves. Hmm. You know, when you get an equatorial mount, you're used, you know, and you're used to an Altaz mount. You know, an Altaz mount is pretty intuitive. You point it in altitude and you move it around, right? You can point it wherever you want. So your mind is thinking that way. But when you get an RA mount or an equatorial mount, the mount doesn't move like you expect. You're trying to center an object and you're saying, well, what the heck is wrong with this thing? Right. You, know, you got to move both axes in a certain way, you know, to get it. So one of the things that people also run into is when they're trying to center an object with like the POTH hand controller. Yeah. They'll try to move it and expect it to move at a fixed distance across the sky like they see in the sky, right? But if you're up near the pole and you punch punch the RA and you're trying to move the star, it's only this far apart, right? Oh, in yeah. your vision, you know. It's, it's hard to even tell well, that it moves. I'm pushing the RA button, it's not moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why is the star not moving in the eyepiece? Right. Moving, they think it's moving. always linear, right? It's always, but it's not. Yeah, exactly. So that's a that's a understanding the coordinate system and what the impact is and scaling. So I wrote a, a message about that. I made a drawing about it and uh, uh, that type of thing. So yeah, there's always explanations like that for beginners to understand. So there's there's a lot to understand. Yeah. So you know, one of the reasons why we we have this live broadcast, you know, is to answer questions from the group. Okay. So if you're if you're watching this and you're a beginner, uh, you know you don't need to feel intimidated or anything. We all all of us had to go through the beginning part of learning how to use uh, a mount, how to polar align it. When I started, we we didn't have digital setting circles. We had real setting circles. You know, we had to use those dials and everything, and you had to wrap your head around the right ascension and declination coordinate system and you had to understand what uh, your local uh, local sidereal time was and, and all of that so uh, um, you know and being able to know you know you would take you know knowing when something was going to come you know you would you could take a local sidereal number and subtract some time and then know when something's going to come up so, it's a right. lot of stuff was going on right. in your head, you know. Um, yep. Polar alignments. Uh, I I used to use um, uh, polar alignment finders and stuff like that, but they're not that. I mean, they're okay, but you can move your eye around back and forth, and you can see the reticle moving against the stars. So, how accurate can that be, right? So, right. Exactly. Uh, so I quickly got into drift aligning. And uh, I bought a crosshair eyepiece. I learned how to drift align. So when I would start out doing my work, and I was not a big astrophotographer, but I wanted the setting circles to be dead on, okay? And so I would drift align so that, you know, I wouldn't see any drift for about five or 10 minutes on a star. And, uh, and that takes about half an hour, an hour to do, you know? But what, what you learn about the sky just by doing a drift alignment is is a lot. You know, you start to become intimate with the sky that you're looking at. And so right. that's, right. that's um, I think that's important. Amateur astronomers have all kinds of tools now for polar alignment. They've got, uh, they, uh, SharpCap has that uh, yep. uh, tool. Um, uh, there's the Pole Master. Pole Master, um, yep. You know, there's uh, PhD guiding. If you're doing auto guiding, PhD yeah. guiding can measure the the uh, polar alignment, right? Drift. Mm -hmm. Or you know, another technique that you could do is just make sure you got a really great level. Okay, uh, make sure that you've adjusted out the cone angle. You know, like I described in the last program. You know, finding where 90 degrees really is on your scope, uh, and then um, you know. Uh, 
pointing it at what you think is north, um, uh, getting a rough polar alignment, and then just simply doing a go-to. Do a go-to to a star. If it doesn't like nail the star, okay, you know your polar alignment's off, all right? It's not, it's not the alignment model or, or the uh, astrometry in, in the database so much. You know, it is really more about uh, how far off polar alignment you are. Then you can go down and adjust the azimuth and altitude of the equatorial mount, center that up, go to another star on the other side of the sky. Do that a couple of times, you know, until you're getting it to fit. And that's another way to do this. So yeah, there's three. Or, there's several different methods to Many. get a polar alignment yeah. that people have developed over the decades. You know, it's best to know a manual way of doing it, either drift alignment or this other method you just talked about. Mm -hmm. To manually to manually do it on <clears> any star, you don't want to you don't want to limit yourself to the north star because sometimes you'll be in a location where you don't see the north star, and it's because mm -hmm. of a tree or a house or something. You know. Mm -hmm. And that happens quite a bit, so it's always best to, early on in your astronomy hobby career, you learn how to do an alignment that's a manual method, because mm -hmm. you don't need batteries for that. Right. Except for your mount batteries, you know. <laughs> you don't need to program, you don't need a computer, you have your method and your procedure right. to go through. Ken Noble says, um, that would be a cool topic, a live demo on drift alignment. Ken, if you could watch me do a drift alignment over the course of an hour, it would be like watching paint dry, okay? Pretty boring, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you're going to want to know how to, you're going to want to understand how to wrap your head around this like in about, oh, five minutes, okay? Uh, so uh, I, will, I will start putting together a PowerPoint presentation on how to do drift alignment. Let's, and we'll see you know, we'll see how good I can, I can make this. Um, uh, it is, uh, this is usually something that I would do with you. Okay. We would set up your telescope. We'd put an across our eyepiece. You know, we would point the telescope out at, uh, zero degrees declination, uh, after what you, you did a rough alignment. Okay. We go to zero degrees declination. We throw in the cross our eyepiece and we'd watch whether the star was drifting up or down against the crosshair. And then we'd make an adjustment on, on, the, uh, on the equatorial part of the mount, you know, which is the azimuth and altitude. Once you've got one uh, axis done, then you go to the other one and uh, you watch the star rising uh, roughly about 15, 20 degrees off the east horizon and uh, roughly at zero degrees declination and you make that final adjustment. And once you have that, yeah, you're you're ready for a solid night of uh, of great astrophotography and uh, great pointing with your go-to telescope. Yep, Dave, you don't need you don't need Polaris to do this. You just need to kind of know that it's over this way. So he says he has a street light blocking his line of sight. So what I would do is I would you know if if I could somehow come over to your house, Dave, we would set up. In your backyard, and we would look, we would look overhead, uh, more or less at the zenith, um, and uh, and then we would pick another star on the eastern horizon. So, but um, yeah, it's it's not so tough. Um, I've got a picture from my book, my first book, Scientific Astrophotography, that shows how I what a drift alignment looks like on an image that I used to do with the camera. Okay. So let me, uh, I'll share that here. Let me zoom there. up on it. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, somebody, I think it's Wade, sent you a couple of astro photographs in your email that he wanted to share. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah. Um, let me share my screen. You see that? Let's see. Not yet. Hold on. Why not? Ah, here we go. There we are. Oh, wow. So the way this is taken, you see you got a blob here. You see my little hand? Yep. 
you got the star that I say. So I'd start the image. I, I, it's tracking for about 10 or 15 seconds. And then I drive it the opposite way uh, for 30 seconds or whatever, however long I think that to get an image across the, the frame. And then I drive it back. And that, that, that's a very precise way of knowing how much it drifted during that time. This is over a minute period or something like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so you keep going. So you basically do that. You do a tweak, and then you drive it back and forth again. You do a tweak, and then what your goal is to make this V, of course, these two lines come together. So there's no drift. And this is, so the axis, the up and down axis on this is the ac- declination. Right and left is RA is right ascension, of course. So, this is this is the method I describe in my book to do drift alignment with a with a camera. That's, so, really, that's interesting. And this was, uh, let's see, uh, I don't know. If this is in the procedure section, uh, but that's what it looks like when you do it that way. So. Let me, uh, I'm going to stop my share for a minute and I'll go look for Wade's pictures. Okay. Oh, he sent me a flat. Man, that thing is... <laughs> <laughs> is it dirty? <laughs> well, so one of the pictures came through. The other one didn't for some reason. It's got NGC 7000 final. Yes. Let me, uh, let me see if I can save these. There's the first one. I don't know why. There's lots of videos, actually, on... Um, uh, mostly on PhD2 drift alignment. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But there is another one here. Let's see. Precise polar alignment. The person doing the video is out of focus. <laughs> I don't know how good it was. It's will always be. fun. I'm looking at some of the comments uh, from that video. A guy named uh, Sean Hawkins says Is there a way to drift a line during the daytime for solar viewing? No, <laughs> there's not. Not exactly. You can't drift a line on the sun. Okay, I tried it when I was in Mauna Kea for the Nova, um, uh, you know, expedition that for the total eclipse in '91. Uh, you have to do it at night on stars. Oh, but there is a way to pull a line during the day. There's way, yeah, but not drift aligning. No, not drift line. There's not another method. Aligning. There's another. There's other methods. Yes, yes, there are. Yes, there are. And there's, it's a manual method, too. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to share Wade's photo of his uh, flat. Of, so this thing is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. All right. You see that? Oh, yeah. There's a couple of specs on there. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. So That's why you do flats, you the, right? What's that? That's why you do flats. That's right. So if you notice, there's these big circles that are shadows of the dust speck, and then there's little circles which are shadows. So this tells me he's got a filter, which the big circles, so the dust particles on the filter, which is further away from the image plane. Yeah. That's why I cast a bigger shadow, and then one dust particles that are right on the image plane are these little circles. And he's got some, see, so that's that's a little circle. That's a dust particle that's on the that's on the image chip, basically. Mm-hmm. These these bigger ones are probably on his filter or what corrector, whatever it is. It's the optic in front of the uh, camera. So. And what was the other image that he sent over? Well, I'm, 
I'm trying to bring it up in my email. It doesn't seem to want to bring it over. I don't know if it's too big. Sometimes, let me see if I can save it here. It doesn't seem to want to um, from when? save. My email program, if the if the file, I don't know how big the file is. If it thinks it's too big, it, it, wouldn't, it doesn't show up in the Over, email. Some email, I mean, like our email at Mead, our, at Mead was like a five megabyte file was too big, something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. So there was a lot of mailing of thumb drives and CDs with stuff burned into them. Uh, and then when I first started to explore scientific, my email would only hold 20 megabytes, which I thought was big. Okay. And now I have, you know, we use Dropbox and all kinds of stuff to move files around. <laughs> Somebody says super gross flat, clean that optical train. Yeah. I, I found that picture I was talking about earlier and how the, uh, how the buttons and path move the scope. Yeah. And it's different than what people think. So let me, let me really, I'll real quickly do that. Oh, wow. Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm getting an idea from watching this video on drift alignment because he's, uh, he's made kind of a, uh, a manual, um, graphic instead of computer graphics. Uh huh. That's actually, he's done a good job. So the graphic I'm showing right now is basically the difference between moving an RA and deck at the celestial equator near deck equals zero. Mm -hmm. And when you're near the pole. Mm -hmm. So the, the reason people get confused is the RA moves <laughs> 90 degrees the position between one star and the next, the S1 and S2, when you're near the pole, where it would would only move a small amount when you're at the at the uh, zero deck, the, the celestial equator. Mm -hmm. And that's 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 a concept that people have to wrap their head around when they're moving the mount to center an object. Yeah, I I would think that that would be a little bit could be it could be a problem during polar alignment I suppose, um, but mostly the biggest problem is that people when they're starting still have a very tough time wrapping their head around how the sky works. You know, that's that's the big one. Right, right. And that's and what we've been you, talking. Go ahead. We've been talking to our uh, customer service reps about that. Yeah. Uh, just in yeah, our they're training. still they're, the, the beginners in there are still kind of going. Yeah. You know, my head hurts over this, you know, so. But if you do a, a drift alignment a, three times in a row during the course of a night, you know, that's how I trained uh, people in my astronomy club. They would they would do the drift alignment. I would make sure they weren't trying to pull a line on Venus or something, you know, or Sirius because they thought the brightest star in the whole sky was the pole star. Uh, I've seen right, that a lot. Right. Uh, yeah, it was funny because you'd see all the telescopes at the star party, and there'd be like 100 people there, you know, and everybody's got their mounts all aimed one way, and then you see one guy and his mounts aimed that way, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's Venus. <laughs> <laughs> and there's Venus. <laughs> yeah. I can't track. Yeah. Yeah, so, but... Uh, yeah, I said, you know, the first thing is to look what everybody else is doing, you know. And uh, anyways, you know, when people are just first learning, you don't want to tease them too much because we had to go through that, you know. We were yes. we were there. We were absolutely yep. there. So, yep. um, let's see. Let me read some comments here. Um, Jeff Wise wants to know if he can buy a signed book from you. Sure. Yeah, I think that's possible. I'll get it. I, I actually, typically when I sell books, I give it, I, I sell them at my cost, mm -hmm. which is a substantial discount off the list. It's 40% off the list price. Oh, buy it from Jerry. And then, and then they, and, and then, then sign you it. know, ask for, ask for shipping. 
that's like three dollars or something, five dollars. I don't know what yeah. it is. Right. So send me an email, and I'll order a book, and then uh, you can. I'll give you my PayPal account to send me the money, and uh, and then I'll send it to you signed. And I I've got two books. Pick, tell me which one you want. You know. David Samard says, can I star loading the info? I think you're talking, David, I think you're talking about the, uh, the uh, database for the, uh, for the Explore Stars database. Uh, not yet. We have to build out the form, the front end and all that. But uh, uh, I, I'm kind of curious just from a from the people that are listening right now, how many of you would be interested in uh, supporting, um, you know, adding to our current database of uh, objects for Explore Stars? Maybe you can weigh in. That's something that we talked about yesterday, I think, and I yeah. told you I was going to create a poll or a question about it on our forum. Mm -hmm. So I, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> I got to go do that. Scott, when are the 115 millimeter carbon fiber scopes going to be back in stock? I don't expect that we will have more inventory of them. We may at the very end of the year, uh, but it may be sometime next year. Uh, uh, it takes, you know, we have orders placed, but it takes nine to 10 months to get the glass. Okay. That's just the raw material before we start polishing it. That's the big weight on, on telescopes for the, for the most part for the whole industry because of what the glass makers do, okay? If they can't get an order for 10,000 pieces uh, from, a, um, from a customer, then that's not a serious order to them, okay? And in this industry, uh, in the high-end telescope, nobody sells 10,000 of anything, okay, uh, in a year. It's... Uh, um, you know, if, if you sold, uh, a thousand, uh, uh, high-end refractors of certain, of a certain model, that would be an incredible banner year for that telescope. Okay. For the most part, um, in a year you'll sell somewhere between 300 to 800 of a, of a refractor model. You know, that's, that's the way that goes. And in eyepieces, uh, you know, I have placed orders at one time for upwards of two to three thousand pieces on one. You know, uh, but uh, in in general, uh, you, you sell much less. You know, uh, it's a very all of us that are in this hobby that buy this this uh, nicer equipment. It is um, uh, you know we're in a a niche market in a cottage industry, you know, so, and everything's made by hand. Paul Masters, I still need a telescope. Now with my DLS, DSLR and telephoto lens, what do you recommend for a beginner? Paul, I probably recommend a, um, uh, for your first telescope, uh, probably if you're going to be an astrophotographer, probably a four inch, um, either an acromat or an apocromat. You know, if you want to do one shot color, it'll, it'll probably be an Apo. And, uh, um, you know, you'll be very pleased with that uh, size of an instrument and you may not outgrow it. Um, you can do quite a bit with a four inch telescope. Uh, out of our line, that would be the ED-102. Uh, uh, the newest one that we have is an FCD-100. Uh, it has beautiful images. Um, uh, or if you are going to shoot narrow band, you could just go with it, one of our acromats and save a lot of money uh, and go with a four inch acromat. Paul Masters, so four inches equals 80 millimeters. No, four inches equals uh, 100 millimeters, a little bit over 100. So with the AR, with narrowband, you basically pay yeah. for the, the filters instead of the telescope. That's what it comes down to. Right, yeah. But if you're going to use uh, your camera with narrowband filters on a number of different telescopes, you know, then then you're getting some economy of scale, you know. Michael Whitaker, guys, can I install the Exos 2 and ASCOM drivers on a Mac, uh, including any firmware updates? ASCOM is only Windows. 
Uh, but uh, what's the equivalent to ASCOM for Mac? So Mac, you have Indy, which is the uh, the platform that was developed for Linux, but also runs under Mac OS because Mac OS is basically <coughs> Linux. Yeah. Uh, you also you also have the option of um, what was I going to say um, with Mac um, Alpaca. So ASCOM has a new uh, cross-platform uh, infrastructure called Alpaca. So if you go to the ASCOM-platform.org website, you'll you can read about Alpaca, and that allows you to share um, uh, an ASCOM driver on a Windows system over to other systems. On multiple platforms, platforms, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Very cool. So, mm -hmm. Jeff Wise says, my telescope is beautiful. Thank you for making such a nice instrument. Thank you, Jeff. We try to make them pretty. <laughs> yep. But not perfect. Perfect doesn't exist, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, let's see. Jeff Wise says, Alpaca Bob. Let's see. Any other... Someone needs to replace the battery in their smoke detector. Could you know who that is, Jerry? No, no idea. No idea. Yeah. Sorry. Must be like a strange signal coming over, you know, through the internet from somebody else's. Wade Prunty, the dust is in your actual sensor. Yeah, the ones that are really defined, they're probably laying right on top yep. of the sensor. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Now, could you, through flats and maybe dithering or something like that, just completely eliminate a speck like that, Jerry? Oh, yeah. That's what flats are designed to do. Not only the dust, it gets rid of the dust bunnies is what they're called. Yeah. And, uh, and vignetting. If you have vignetting, vignetting on the edge of the field, they'll right. correct for that. It corrects for... Um, uh, actually, it's designed also to correct for the gain variation across all the pixels. Every pixel is not the same in terms of its uh, uh, kind of the range of, of values that it puts out based on how much light it receives. So each pixel is like a separate instrument that you're measuring photons with. So the flat will also normalize the gain across all the pixels. Even if you have no vignetting and no dust bunnies, you still correct that also. Mm -hmm. Jeff Wise wants to know, can I go over what the best application of the 80, 102, 115, 127, and 152 are? Okay, so roughly what I can tell you is that as you increase aperture, you're going to increase resolution, okay? Um, so if we are, um, you know, if you're looking for the very finest structure uh, in nebulosity and in galaxies, um, there's a couple of ways to go about it. One of them, a really hard way to go about it, is uh, you use a smaller aperture telescope, but with longer focal length. And then you can take multiple images. Let's say it's the Andromeda galaxy, and you take, you know, 20 different sections, you're doing uh, tracking and stacking on each one. So let's say you do, uh, you know, 50 or 100 uh, uh, light frames uh, per mosaic piece, okay? And then you got 20 on top of that. And then you're stitching them, stitching software that will stitch it all together. And that will give you the resolution, okay? Um, I've seen some really remarkable stuff done with a small aperture scope, but long focal length doing that. It's lots of work, okay, in post-processing. Uh, if you're looking for one-shot color, uh, then uh, you're going to be looking at uh, you're going to be looking at an Apo or a reflector, a pure reflector telescope, because they have no chromatic aberration, right? Uh, people fall in love with refractors because they are so high contrast, uh, and you know every square millimeter of the aperture is devoted to imaging on a refractor versus, you know, having a secondary mirror cutting out part of the, the light and the resolution. Um, uh, but uh, in general, I would, I would look at the 80, 102, and 115 because of 
portability. You know, a lot of people think, oh, you know, well, what's, you know, if you just want me to talk about one thing, how much better the image is going to be. Um, someone that knows what they're doing can take an 80 and really challenge what somebody's doing with a 152. Amateur astronomers do it all the time. They take a small telescope, they make a mind-blowing image, and then they compare it against a Palomar 200-inch telescope image that was done in the 60s or something, you know? And they're actually, they're blowing it away. So, you know, what's the best purpose? You know, what's the, you know, it, basically it is taking what you got, okay? Having an instrument that you are going to use all the time, okay? All the time. And if that's a little telescope, then by God, get a, Get a little telescope, okay? It's, it's, right. It's something that you want to take out that you don't have a problem taking yeah, out. If yes. it gets to be burdensome, then that'll put a kibosh yes. on anything you want to do. I know a lot of people that have bought very large and very expensive telescopes, and they have all that energy, that new energy that you have as a beginner, okay? And they have, like, no problem hauling this thing out of the van or the truck, and three guys are putting it together, and... You know, they're all admiring it and everything. And then they look through it and they're like, oh, my God, that's awesome. And then they've worked a 60 or 70 hour work week. And now it's star party time. Yeah, <laughs> you that look was at me. the beast and you go, ah, I don't know. I don't think I'm taking it out this time. All right. And so you have these guys that infrequently go because they also think they have to go to a pristine dark site. OK. And so they'll go out three, four, five times a year. You know, when, you know, somebody with a little telescope, he's out there 100 nights, you know, 150 nights, 200 nights. Who do you think is the better astronomer? You know, it's the guy that goes out all the time. It is fun to use bigger telescopes. There are advantages with light grasp resolution. OK, um, if you are someone that switches between astrophotography and visual with the same instrument, visually, there's no substitute for aperture, really. Um, so, um, you know, and so when we could go out and, uh, uh, you know, and compare telescopes and stuff, you know, before, before the pandemic hit, I would recommend somebody, uh, goes to a big star party and they take a mask. So a lot of guys will have 16 inch and larger telescopes, you know, 20 inch, 30 inch. You know, uh, it's not unheard of to see a 36 inch out on the field. OK, but if you have a mask, then what you can do is you can look, you can say, you know, pick some objects that are your favorites, like a galaxy or a nebula or something or star clusters or, you know, even a planet. And then just hold the mask, have somebody hold the mask in front of the telescope while you look through it. And you can see what a 10 inch is going to look like and an eight inch and a six and a four and a three and a two if you want. OK, and you'll see what happens to the image brightness and the resolving power. OK, um, if the seeing is not good, OK, you will find out that smaller aperture scopes work better than bigger aperture scopes do during bad seeing, you know, because they are not resolving all the bad seeing conditions. You know, telescopes are resolving machines. So, but uh, the thing I can tell you is, is that you can always make a big telescope smaller. You can never make a small telescope bigger. And so that's, that's the uh, advantage right. of uh, right. going as large of a telescope as you are willing to carry around. Uh, and then you need to balance out the cost of things too. And probably the best book I've read so far, I'm going to, you know, uh, give uh, get some preps to Jerry Hubble here because he wrote a book called uh, It's Scientific Imaging. You'll find it on Amazon as well. Uh, and uh, Scientific astrophotography. Scientific mm -hmm. astrophotography, that's right. And he talks about how to, you know, critically analyze your solution, okay, in, in a telescope. And a lot of times you're going to find out you're going to be building, you're going to be integrating a system. You know, not all of it's going to come from one company. You know, the, let me show you. Let me show you. Ten years ago, what I had set up in terms of we're talking about people carting things out to set up and getting tired of doing it. Mm -hmm. So I did this configuration probably for about three months. So let me share it real quick. Um, all 
All right, do you see that? Yep. <laughs> so what was the, it looks like it's crazy. So you have a refractor and a Schmidt Casa grain? That's a that's an RC scope. That's oh, well, the GSO a, that's the RC scope. At yep. the AstroTech eight inch RC okay. that I had. Mm -hmm. I still have it, of course. This is the this is the Skywatcher Equinox one twenty that I sold to a guy in Australia, and I bought the one twenty seven from you, Scott, at Neef. And there's my trusty uh, EQ six right. mount right. before I put the telescope drive master on it. Right. So. That's do you, it. Do you use any of this setup anymore? No, no, no. Uh, uh I use the MSRO. I got that. Uh, you got the Mark Start up in five minutes. You know, right? I can I can get on in five minutes and start imaging. Mm -hmm. Paul Masters says he has one last question: Apo doublet or Apo triplet? Is it useful to get a triple? Okay, if you're doing visual astronomy uh, and you're not going to do narrow band one shot color, okay, but you're going to do you got a monochrome camera and you're going to do na narrow band imaging, then I would say. Uh, you know, you can def definitely go with a Apo doublet. The, the, the doublets are not really true Apos. They are semi-Apos, okay? Uh, you can get them with FPL 53 glass, and yeah, they're, they're better uh, than, than just, a, just a standard doublet as far as chromatic aberration goes, but uh, they will have more chromatic aberration than a triplet will. You know, triplets have a big advantage uh, because you can make just a little bit more correction with that third lens. Um, so, uh, you know. Hey Scott? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, I don't think you shared that picture when I showed it. Oh, let me see. At least a message on the screen. Okay. That could be. I have to bring it back up on my screen. Yeah, bring it back up. All right, there you go. Okay. I, did, I didn't look up at the YouTube to see if it showed up there. Oh, I see. Shared screen. It's coming up in a separate little thing here. There we go. Oh, uh, is it? That's your image of, of the telescope. We, sh yep. we showed that. Oh, really? Because somebody said they didn't see it. Okay. I think we showed it. I don't know. Well, there it is again. <laughs> there it is again. <laughs> yep. All right. So I stopped. Oh, now. they say they didn't see it before. Okay. There we go. There we go. All right. Um, and I can't so, remember uh, exactly where I was going. Else, but. Was there anything else? I know somebody sent me. Somebody said they sent me an email. I think. I think. Uh, I don't know where it is here. Wade. Yeah, Wade sent you a couple of images. Oh, this is so. This is the second time. He sent me the image I couldn't download, so here it is. I've got it now. Jeff Y says, so you can image almost anything with each scope? Yes, Jeff, you can. Uh, as you go shorter focal length, of course, you get wider fields of view. Um, as you go longer focal length, you know, let's say that you want to do small objects like planetary, nebula, and planets, all right? So, uh, you know, then, then you're going to want to get a scope that is inherently longer focal length. On top of that, you might use also a Barlow lens or even a, you know, we sell focal extenders uh, that can double uh, that uh, focal length. But there is, there really is not one telescope that does it all, okay? So uh, you need to get out of your mind that I'm going to buy one telescope and that's it. And that's what I'm going to do all my work with unless you only do a certain kind of work. If you do, if you are a general purpose astronomer and you like to look at everything and do everything, you're going to end up with about two or three different telescopes, you know? Right. When there I go out myself, I, I like to have a big Dobsonian, and then I like to have a refractor in case, you know, I want to do some precision planetary work or, you know, start doing some astrophotography. 
there is fundamental there is a fundamental uh, limit that affects all telescopes, even with the uh, higher diffraction limited or you know higher resolution that way mm-hmm. is the sky. The sky, especially for ninety five percent of us that live in standard backyards, your seeing is going to limit. Oh yeah. What the image resolution is. That's right. Absolutely. That's and right. And I always tell people you want to be critically sampled, which means you're sizing the image scale to what your sky conditions are. And for me, the sweet spot for that is a thousand millimeters. So, for example, let's say you were trying to use a Smith Cassegrain to do a mosaic, like you were talking about before, and your image and your focal length was 2,500 millimeters. All right. You could do the same thing with a with a larger scope now you have to gather more light but in terms of resolution you can do that with a thousand millimeter scope and not have to create so many panels to stitch together uh is what it comes down to Uh, because the sky again is only going to give you so much so you want to take advantage of that in terms of uh the image scale and as also storage space on your computer a lot of people use dslrs to image which have these huge 24 you know, 20 megapixel, 24 megapixel images that gather a lot more uh, pixels than the sky will give you in terms of resolution. So you have these big stars that are blobs that cover a ton of pixels where you want to be, you only want to have like two to three pixels per width of the star to be critically sampled. It's called the full width at half maximum. Uh, And that'll save you tons of storage space. You don't, you don't, and and processing time. If you if you're processing 24 hour images, 24 megapixel images, each image is 24 megapixels. Let's say you have a hundred of them to stack. That's a <laughs> that's a huge process that yeah. takes forever. Now, if you were to reduce those images down from 24 megapixels to let's say six megapixels or four megapixels, and you still have all the data that the sky would give you, then that's much better. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Yeah. But I'm, I'm glad you guys are asking these questions on the air with us because um, th- this is, uh, you know, this is uh, a good time, uh, you know, for you to, uh, you know, ask any kind of question that you might have. So, um, you know, you don't always have to uh, put in a, a, a request on... Uh, you know, on our, our chat systems or our email systems or to ask a case unless you need like a part replacement or something. If you're looking for some advice, you know, ask it here on the show and then we can answer your question and all the other people that are listening, uh, you know, all the other people that are listening can um, uh, get the benefit of, of uh, that answer as well. This is Wade Prunty's image that he sent me. Mm, that was beautiful. So this was processed with that flat that he showed us. Yeah, it's beautiful. I think that's correct. I think that's what he said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's bring that up full screen again. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> You're muted again, Jerry. Is it back? Yeah. You're back. It's back. <laughs> so yeah, it's back beautiful. There. It's breathtaking. Yeah. Good job, Wade. Yeah, so that shows you how flats, even as ugly as they are, they're they're needed to create, you know, the best images. Richard Lighthill is asking a question about uh, flats. Um, he says, does the color source of a flat affect its ability to do its thing? For example, blue sky, incandescent, fluorescent, etc. It's in monochrome, right? So I would say... Well, it depends on your image. Yeah, so the color, the color temperature of the flat, you want white light flat for if you're doing a color. Yeah, one shot. You have a one shot color. That's true. You absolutely need... Um, and you got to... You gotta, no, I don't know how precisely you need to know, but you need to have a reasonable color temperature. And one of the reason, one of the ways you can measure the color of the sky, well, is, is to actually measure the color of the sky, one of your sky images, to see what the what the background color really is. Um, 
And it's typically going to be a dark blue color, um, probably, I imagine. I don't do a whole lot of one-shot color uh, imaging in terms of calibrations, so mm-hmm. I'm not that familiar with it. But other people that are maybe on the on the call or on the uh, show may know more about that. I'm sure that Gary uh, knows uh, about that. But I'm sure there's a way to measure the, the color uh, yeah. of your flat. Uh, and, and to me, the sky background probably the best is the best correction because yes. that's, that's where we see these objects in the sky. So you want to be able to neutralize the, uh, atmospheric color, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Richard Lyhill says, I've heard people say, shoot the sky away from the sun. That's for a consistent flat, you know, cause you're right. getting close to the sun, then you've got a brighter side than the other side, you know? Right. Right. And, and I usually point my uh, scope at zenith at, and do the flats after sunset, of course. But in the north sky, in the north or east, if, if the sun's setting, in the west in the morning, mm-hmm. away from the sun, like you said. But I typically point the scope to zenith because of the, um, the atmosphere's thinnest there, right, to the sky. You're, short, you're pointing straight up through the atmosphere instead of at an angle, so you don't have the all the stuff that's in the atmosphere to contaminate your flat. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and people call them, uh, t-shirt flats too. When you, to diffuse the light even further, you, you place some fabric like cotton t-shirt over yeah, top yeah. to filter the light, to make it more uniform, basically. Although the, if you've got a nice clear sky, it's fairly uniform, but that you've got clouds, you'll see of the clouds in the uh, flats. Yeah. So that's not a good thing. Wade Even high is, clouds. Wade is giving some good advice here. He says sky flats are not always the best. He's right. Uh, and he says you need to make sure your light source is giving you even colors on the histogram. So you can make a um, you can make a light box. If you guys look on uh, just on uh, just Google uh, light box for making flats, uh, you're going to see all kinds of things that you can make out of uh, foam core and, you know, you know, more or less transparent uh, paper, um, you know, and then making a very even light source uh, from the inside. So Right. The key to that is to bounce the light around three or four different corners. Yeah. If you look at the designs, you'll see that they have a light at one and it bounces it around to disperse it. And, um, and then it shows up at the end. Yeah, it comes out really diffuse. Yeah. Right. Dave Ng says he uses a T-shirt in his tablet with a white screen, then adjusts the exposure to get minus 40 to minus 50% uh, ADU. Um, there was someone that asked a question. Oh, Jeff Weiss. He says, I want to be able to understand what Jerry just said about critical sampling and image size. Can you break that a little, down a little bit more, Jerry? Yeah, so... Uh, if you're not familiar, the when you image a star on a through a telescope onto a CCD camera, it creates a profile called the point spread function, and it's a Gaussian shape profile. So think about what you're looking at. Like here, if you look at this star, I'm going to zoom up on one of these stars. It's rendered this way on the display, but this actually looks as you move across the star, it's going to look like a Gaussian shape. It's going to be now, a bell-shaped curve a in bell terms shape. of brightness. Yeah, it's a bell in shape. In terms of brightness, right? Mm-hmm. So and the way that's measured is called the full width at half maximum. So you go up to half the peak, and you measure the width of that bell shape, okay? And it's in pixels, okay? So that's that width is the best resolution you'll get out of any image in the sky for deep sky. It's basically, that's the best you can do. So that's in terms of pixels or in terms of arc seconds, depending on what your second, you know, your arc seconds per pixel scale is. So to be critically sampled, you want that full width at half maximum to, to be between two and three pixels. You don't want it to be 10 pixels, like a real blobby star would look, a really, really fat, like for example, one of these stars cover a lot of pixels, these larger, and it's only because they're saturated that they're so large, okay? 
-hmm. If you properly expose the star, <clears throat> the peak's not going to exceed the, the full well depth of the camera or the, the ADC counts aren't going to exceed the top. Where if you got a big blobby star like it's in this picture, that means it's been overexposed. But this is what you'll see if it's out of focus also. You'll True. see all the stars look this wide, right? So right. if it's out of focus or if the seeing is bad, you'll get a big blobby star. So let's say you do have Even uh, the, the best one. you can get. You know, the best you can get for your width is uh, with the image scale is like three arc seconds, right? In the sky, two to three arc seconds. So that means to be critically sampled, you want your image scale to be about one arc second per pixel or maybe one and a half arc seconds per pixel. Uh, so what that means is that once you get that one and a half arc seconds per pixel, then, then you can figure out based on your focal length, what the field of view will be. And once you get the field of view, then you say, okay, how many pixels will, will give me that field of view based on this arc seconds per pixel. And that's all the pixels you need. You don't need more. So, for example, uh, an image from a, C an, a digital SLR might be t 16 megapixels or 20, me 20 megapixels. But the field of view for your image train is, let's say it's one degree by one and a half degrees. And you're seeing, so all you, all you need based on your seeing is 1,800 pixels across by 1,200 pixels high. All right. So you can tell that's only, what, three megapixels maybe. Right or two megapixels? Yes, yeah, so you don't need these giant megapixel cameras. Right, so you got these big giant megapixel cameras that are oversampling the sky, and then you only need like four megapixels. Yeah, and you spend all that money on the. On the well, it's not just that; it's 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 storage space. To me, it's storage space and processing time. They're huge images, and you and I'm sure Wade can talk about this. Uh, yeah, I'm sure he's delved into uh, oh, the yeah. critical sampling. Sure, but that's basically the gist of it. The sky only gives you so much. You, it's it's just like when you're looking through a uh, an eyepiece at a pla at the moon or a planet, and you say, "Oh man, look! I can see these details, these clouds. I'm gonna raise my eyepiece magnification," and you blow it up into this big blob, right? Yeah. But you don't see any more. So that's right. the problem. That's true. So that's the Richard, same thing. Richard Lighthill has another question. He says, "Perhaps I ought to take the one shot color and just make it a black and white TIFF." I don't think that helps him. So that say that again. Just ba so basically, he wants to turn each. You got of the a color sensor and color you just convert over. it to black and white. Yeah, you can convert it to black and white and get the same resolution, but that's not the, that's not the point of it. The point of it is to uh, match the resolution to what the sky gives you, whether it's monochrome or color. Yeah. All right. Okay. And we're throwing around some acronyms here. ADU number. What's ADU stand for, Jerry? My dogs are barking in the background. It's an analog. It's an analog uh, to digital conversion unit. It's basically uh, analog digital. Analog unit. digital unit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. basically, you take your if you got a 16-bit camera, it'll turn your image pixels into into that a zero to 65,000 count. Mm-hmm. My dogs are going nuts. So try to think of, <clears throat> you know, on the way that CCD cameras work, is that um, they just have a silicon wafer. And the cool thing about the silicon crystal is that when a photon hits it, it converts it to an electron. Okay, so right. so if you take a, a silicon wafer and you make a checkerboard out of it, okay, now you got, you got, and they use this, I don't know what the materials are that they layer on top of the silicon wafer, uh, but uh, they're called dopants. Uh, I think it's applied during, uh, 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 in a vacuum process, much like doing coatings, okay. <clears throat> they must have a mask of some sort, something like that. Anyways. These little boxes, you know, these little squares now uh, are are capturing the photons, and they can't they can't get out of their little box. Okay, so as as a photon comes in, it's converting to electron, converting to electron, converting to electron. Okay. Well, the right. 
that 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 box is called a charge well. Okay, and so uh, you might be able to collect fifty thousand or seventy thousand electrons in there. Okay, all right. So the way that it's going, to, the the way that the chip is then read out, they do something called clocking. And what happens is is that that now after the exposure is done, all these electrons are still on those in their little uh, channels. And then what they do is they hit one side of the, um, the silicon wafer with an electric charge. And it makes all the electrons on that side of the chip jump over to run down a wire to an analog to digital converter, okay? So now your computer is getting digital signal, okay? Uh, and so we, as we're clocking, we, we hit it with an electronic charge. It makes everything jump jump, jump. And so they're all, they're going like that until they come out. So think about a bunch of ping pong balls now coming out. You know, first we got, you know, 20,000 ping pong balls coming out. And now we got five. Okay. And now we got 10,000 and we got this and we got that. Okay. So now that's how an image starts to be built up. All right. Uh, the critical sampling has to do with, uh, you know, the resolving power and getting the full width, half max, uh, proper signal from the star. And the way you can think about this is uh, all of us have seen a raindrop fall onto a, a pool of water and those frozen pictures, you know, the high speed pictures of the, of the water leaping up. Okay. That's, that's the Gaussian curve of the, the energy of a water drop hitting water. Okay. And, um, and so you can think of light doing the same thing. You got these photons hitting down onto the sensor, uh, and uh, you know if they're going on two by two uh, pixels, uh, which is usually the a good full full width half max um, uh, proper signal, uh, you're going to see this Gaussian curve uh, coming up, and uh, um, you know this is what uh, this is the topography and the geometry of light as it's going as light is hitting that sensor and the uh, explanation of the charge wells and the, um, uh, the way that a, a chip is clocked out, that's the basic way that it works. CMOS sensors also work in a similar way, you know? Right. The, the difference between CMOS has its own amplifier where on a CCD, there's one amplifier per row when it's read out. Mm hmm uh, so that's a big difference. And the, the difference also is CCDs, you know, their charge wells are much bigger in terms of the proportion of the, um, percentage of area covered, uh, in a CMOS pixel, there's a big piece of the chunk of that area is covered is, is the amplifier. So you don't have quite the efficiency in area and space. So that's why you, sometimes you see these little lens that lens things that concentrate the light from the pixel down into the charge well that's much smaller mm. portion of that. Have you seen those overlays that have these little tiny lens cells that concentrate the light over that area into that? Yeah, particular... I think I saw some of that stuff when yeah. I went to Texas Instruments. So you got that kind of overlay. And then you got another thing called the Bayer Pattern Array, which, which gives you the one-shot color. So it adds on where they put a different filter over each pixel. Right. This, of course, uh, lowers your resolution. But I'll tell you that CMOS has come a long way over where it used to be. I mean, it used to be that uh, amateur astronomers only preferred CCD cameras. Uh, you know, and then, and then I remember they went to, uh, uh, you know, back thin, you know, back illuminated uh, uh, CCDs and uh, these kinds of CCD wafers and stuff, especially with nearly zero defects, were really expensive, you know, really expensive. CMOS was made in much higher quantities because they were being put into DSLRs and, and amateur astronomers benefited from the uh, from the production levels of, uh, for regular cameras, you know, and, right, so, right. and they, and, and you have, uh, companies like, uh, ZWL and, and other companies that make, uh, amateur astrophotography cameras sort of benefiting from that. They would, 
they would you know buy the sensors from Sony or whatever that these sensors were being used you know being bought by the millions okay and that's how you get a CCD camera that doesn't cost you 20 grand okay right exactly it costs yeah. so one two of the grand, one of the or problems one grand or forward. less yeah right one of the, one of the problems going forward that I that I've started to pick up on is uh once the technology moves, so if the technology moves on in CMOS to where they start making chips for cameras, for phones and things, and other security cameras, mm -hmm. there's a there's a risk that the can that the chips won't be suitable any any longer for doing uh, astro imaging. So at that point, they don't make the numbers of cameras that they or the number of chips that they do today for that are applicable to astronomy. Mm -hmm. That would that's the risk that there is with that. So if you've got a good CMOS camera today and you're, you're, you're I would get into that and keep it for a while. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. And the the main thing to do with anything that you have, you know, uh is to use it and and just squeeze out every bit of performance that you can to the point of where you're better than the equipment is, okay? Then it's then that's the time to upgrade, okay? If you're if you're really wanting to be on the bleeding edge of this uh, and really uh, do what amateur astronomers routinely do, which is prove everybody wrong, okay? That you know because they'll say, oh, that can't be done. You got to have this. Or you got to have that. There are there are astrophotographers out there. Like one of them, I, I love to point back to is, um, or a couple of them actually, uh, Jason Genzel uh, does this stuff that's just mind blowing with an acromat. Uh, you know, is it, and I think that a lot of people would say you can't do that. Well, you know, he is doing incredible stuff with an acromat. Um, uh, Jack Newton was another guy. Uh, you know, who is always breaking the boundaries. You know. Uh, he would hear from some professional astronomer, or some very knowledgeable astronomer that, oh, well, you know, you can't image the Hubble deep field, for example. Well, he went out and did it. OK, so uh, <laughs> yeah. he would do he did. He was the first one to get some of this high resolution stuff on the sun. He was put on Time magazine and, and uh, National Geographic and all the rest of it, you know, so. Now, now his whole thing is is discovery of supernova and uh you know, and showing other people, you know, getting people introduced to astronomy. That's what he does mostly now. But uh, he, he's got, I can't remember how many supernova discoveries under his belt, you know. He loves that. So, and it's cool. Um, somebody wanted to know if you can make a good uh, flat just by defocusing. Uh, not really. You need a, you need to block out you don't need you you want a, a target that has no structure in it yeah but there is such a thing as sky flats oh sure where where you I used to where do. you actually do uh use actual images uh yep. to create your flats it's it's a special process where you basically I'm not, I haven't really done it before, but there's a way to do that with uh, with your actual light images that you get with stars in them. There's a way to process them into a sky flat mm -hmm. uh, that's different than than a normal flat. That's a that's a uh, regular sky flat or a twilight flat, I should say. Um, so I think it's I don't know if it's called an image flat or something like that, but there is a way to process your images to to remove the stars basically. And then you have the actual uh, background uh, sky to give you the light or the or the uh, I'm sorry the flat. Mm-hmm. Right. Let's see. Wade Prunty, photons are changed to electrons via the ADC analog to digital converter. Yep. Uh, and registered as ADUs, analog to digital units. Your camera's ADC bit number. Uh, will determine the scale of the dynamic range available to it, which would be the ADU scale. Right, and people know about ISO on digital SLRs. Yeah. ISO, all that is, is the same as the, uh, it's the amplifier gain is what that is. So on an yeah. astro camera, you have gain setting. That's the same as the ISO setting on a digital SLR. Uh, yep. 
the other thing is about quantum, you know, we talk about how efficient it is converting photons to electrons. That's called quantum efficiency. Right. And it's depending on the uh, wavelength of the light, how efficient the chip is. And But the back illuminated chips are upwards of 80% efficient now. Uh, so think about think about what a CCD chip is. And actually the first CCD chip was a, was uh, the same as a solar cell. You know, solar power today, it's the same thing. It turns yeah, photons into big electrons. Yeah, silicon wafer, right? So. Right, exactly. So it's the same process, the same, uh, you know, uh, in effect that causes. So they basically turned a, a photo uh, photo cell into a an imaging chip is what they've done. Yeah. Yeah, silicone, the material of silicone is so important to humanity. I mean, it's how we get glass. It's how we do our optical fiber. It's how we make our silicon sensors. I mean, it is, it is such a critical thing to our society, you know, and, and uh, uh, the benefits of uh, optics and, and, uh, and silicon chips, I, I can't, it's staggering to uh, try to imagine the benefit that it's been to humanity. So, um, Mike Wiesner says, and don't forget, even smartphones can do astrophotography. It's true. You've done some nice ones, Mike. Um, lots of great comments here. Uh, Dave Ng, I think a part of the flat is to cancel out dust buddies. But if you change focus, then the dust no longer matches exactly, and thus you can't remove it as accurately. Uh, yeah, and I, I think... I think that um, um, you know that's one of the benefits of having an apo um, is that uh, you know if you've got it if you got a true apochromat you're really not going to have to be changing focus too much unless your filters are different thicknesses okay and that will force you to change focus and so and if you, you're changing focus. Um, you know, I remember the early days, uh, we shot flats, bias frames, and uh, darks, uh, uh, you know, depending on, on exposure times and temperature changes and focus changes, all of that stuff. So, fil you know, so that's, that's um, you know, but uh, people have gotten pretty good with... Uh, master um, uh, calibration frames and s the software has actually gotten very good at uh, allowing you to make masters so oh yeah mm -hmm. astro beard says if you put power through a solar panel it will not emit ir jeff weiss this is the best stream yet i have to save it <laughs> It's because you guys are asking questions. That's why. <laughs> right. That's right. We want you, you guys to, to come questions. on and ask questions. That's right. So we can answer them or at least some get you guys talking. So anyhow, like it's great to have you guys. Questions. You guys were the audience makes all the difference in the world. And you guys are a great audience. You know, I know that a lot of you watch every show and we're really happy to have you on every show. So um um, maybe in the future, what I do is um, we could also get, uh, we can have an extended um, uh, day where we have you come on Zoom and, uh, and you can watch, uh, you can interact with each other on Zoom too. Similar to what we do for a star party, but it would just be asking questions and going over equipment and astrophotography. So uh, we've been on for yeah, it's how long a long now? show. Almost, almost two, hours, two hours, guys. So um, uh, really ha uh, glad to, uh, to do this show today. It was a very interesting for everything for everybody today. And uh, um, <laughs> Dusty Haskins says, ooh, I like that idea, Scott. OK. All right, well, I'll, I'll set that up, Dusty. And uh, we'll put out the, uh, we'll put out the um, Zoom uh, credentials out there. And I think I can get 50 people on at the same time. So it's a lot. That's, that's, that's going to be fun. <laughs> it's like a giant uh, classroom. Yeah. So I don't know. You know, I'm like a whirling dervish back here sometimes trying to switch scenes and, you know, make sure we got this show running. But 
But, um, you know, I've got to practice more because, uh, you know, this is all kind of leading up to when we go to Starmus. And, uh, you know, we'll be there um, doing live broadcasts from, uh, uh, you know, that uh, particular event. And you've got guys like Brian May and, and uh, you know, I mean, the superstars of the, uh, the astrophysics world will be there. And um, so... Uh, a lot of chances to have some really interesting conversations from these people. So, and uh, hope you can either be there in person or uh, watch it live with me. So, but um, I will be. I'll I'll let you know more about how that will go down as as we get closer to that. We're we're over a year out right now. So, anyhow, you guys, uh, as uh, Jack Horkheimer would always say, keep looking up. And we will see you, uh, what, tomorrow's Friday, right? Yep, tomorrow's Friday, yep. Oh, boy. So thanks, and we want to thank all of the people that support this show. Uh, if you like the show, um, uh, you know, share it, uh, tweet it, talk about it, <laughs> whatever. But, like uh, it, subscribe. Like it, subscribe to it, uh, ring the little bell, um, you know, and... Uh, and we didn't give out a prize this time, did we? We, no, got, we got so yeah, we heavy into the conversation. That that's right. That's right. So, yeah, we'll have to get a prize on for Friday. We will talk to you guys later and keep looking up. Bye-bye.